So today we're tackling a crucial topic for any woman navigating decisions around using tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors like letrozole or anastrozole after breast cancer treatment. What I want to do in this video is to answer the question of what is using these drugs in preventing breast cancer recurrence due to bone health. I also want to compare the two different drugs because I get a lot of questions from women who are grappling with this decision around should they use these drugs or not and what is the impact on bone health and the answer is actually pretty clear. So how do these choices compare? How do these drugs impact premenopausal women versus postmenopausal women? What does the literature say, again, specifically for bone health? And this is a critical conversation because honestly, breast cancer is a big problem. The incidence of breast cancer is going up. And this is not probably because we're screening better. We've been screening for breast cancer for a long time. That hasn't really changed. There is an increase in the incidence of breast cancer by about 0.5 to 1% per year. Now, fortunately, the mortality, meaning the death rate, has actually been going down, and it's been going down quite a bit since the late 1980s in comparison, but the average age of diagnosis is still at 62, which means that half of the cases occur before age 62, and this is where screening becomes really important for midlife and for women. There's actually a scary statistic that 10% of breast cancer cases, new cases are in women under the age of 45. That's why the recommendation is to start screening at 40 or potentially even earlier for those that are at high risk. This is also really important because there are about 300,000 diagnoses of breast cancer in the United States every year. So then answering this question of whether or not to use this adjuvant endocrine therapy, this tamoxifen, these AIs, this is a really important discussion because I tend to have discussions around medical things, medical diagnoses, medical procedures, interventions, drugs, through the lens of longevity and aging. So this is really important when it comes to cancer because surviving cancer is obviously good. This is our goal. We want to beat cancer. But if you're compromising another system to do it, it just sets you up for another potentially challenging battle. For things like breast cancer and these adjuvant endocrine therapies, this actually is a bone health problem. And this is where I come in to help people to make these decisions with their oncology team, with their surgical team. Because choosing the best path forward requires education. It requires empowerment. It requires cooperation and it requires a lot of self-awareness. So to be clear, I am not claiming to be a medical or surgical oncologist. I am not advising anybody on cancer treatment choices, but as an osteoporosis specialist, I do have to have this conversation with my patients to help them navigate the conversations that they're having with the other members of their care team. Because what you choose for this decision may significantly impact the rate of bone loss that you may experience over the subsequent years of this treatment and ultimately whether or not you have osteoporosis, are going to have osteoporosis, and potentially suffer from things like fragility fractures. Now, I'm also not going to discuss the use of hormone therapy or hormone optimization after a breast cancer treatment. That is a controversial and contentious topic that really needs its own platform. I've talked about it before. Uh, this requires requires a, a, a complex and comprehensive discussion around hormones and cancer. So we're not going to talk about that today. It's a totally separate topic. So this came up recently because I had a, a friend, um, she's another, she's a doctor, a colleague of mine um, that is very knowledgeable. She came in because she was overwhelmed by the conflicting recommendations that she was seeing. And she really wanted to get some clarity from my perspective, from the bone health perspective. Now, this woman is young. She is under 45, like that statistic that I just said. She is intelligent. She had a stage one breast cancer that was hormone receptor positive, estrogen and progesterone receptor positive. She elected with her surgical team to undergo a bilateral mastectomy. And now they're talking about these adjuvant endocrine options, this adjuvant endocrine therapy, which is going to be potentially tamoxifen, potentially AIs. And this is the question that, that hundreds of thousands of women a year and millions of women have had to work through because these are, this is the standard of care if you have a hormone receptor positive cancer. Now, my question though is this, if a professional, a smart professional who knows how to read research finds this confusing, how do non-medically trained people manage? I don't know. 
I really don't. But there is hope because with education comes potential power. So this was a long introduction, but stick with me to understand the medications, the implications on their bone health, according to the literature and how we end up guiding our patients, whether they be premenopausal patients or postmenopausal patients, how we help them to have this conversation with their oncology team. Okay, so a couple of basic things. After a diagnosis of breast cancer, there is going to be what's called a primary treatment. Your doctors are going to recommend something, and that is likely going to be some kind of a surgery, lumpectomy, a mastectomy. There might be involved radiation. There might be actual chemotherapy, depending on a, the, the stage, the grade, what kind of cancer this is. And then the ongoing therapy, what's called the adjuvant endocrine therapy, could include these drugs like tamoxifen or AIs, like I mentioned before, and astrozole, letrozole, there's some others. This is recommended because they reduce the risk of recurrence. And this has been clearly shown in literature. Now, tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors both reduce recurrence and mortality, but do it through different mechanisms. And the mechanism is what's really important. So let's talk about tamoxifen first. Tamoxifen is what's called a CIRM. This is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Some people would say modifier. Now, it is actually in the same class and similar to the drug Avista or Riloxifene. Now, Avista is actually a bone health drug. It is FDA approved for the treatment of osteoporosis, and it reduces the risk, especially of vertebral fracture, and increases bone marrow density. Both of these drugs, as CIRMs, will have an impact on estrogen receptors. Again, estrogen receptor modulator. So they can stimulate estrogen receptors variably from tissue to tissue. Now, AIs, on the other hand, aromatase inhibitors are going to be very powerful ways to reduce what the cell sees in conversion of testosterone, other estrogens like estrone or precursors to estrogen into estrogen. This is going to go through, this conversion goes through the process of aromatization. So at the cellular level, you can essentially eliminate estradiol from the cells. This is what aromatase inhibitors will do. But unfortunately, this is for all cells, not just cancer cells. You can't just selectively do this, or at least not yet. So aromatase inhibitors are going to reduce estrogen levels systemically for those that aren't endogenously or naturally producing estrogen like premenopausal women are. Now, the difference in bone impact here is tremendous. Tamoxifen has the potential to improve bone health, especially in postmenopausal women, because it is an estrogen receptor modulator. It actually can be estrogenic for some tissues, and breast and bone are two of those tissues. Now, AIs across the board are going to negatively impact bone health. This is very predictable. This would be true in postmenopausal women, and I'll talk about AIs in premenopausal women a little bit too. So for premenopausal women, if AIs were going to be used alone, they wouldn't have a strong effect because most of a woman's estrogen is coming from her ovaries and AIs aren't going to change that. They're not going to limit the estrogen production in the ovaries. That's why they would be paired in a premenopausal woman. AIs would be paired with ovarian suppression therapy, meaning a drug that would actually eliminate the production of estradiol from the ovaries. So this would actually be two different things. And you can imagine at that point, you are chemically inducing menopause and you are eliminating estrogen at the cellular level. This is going to have a profound impact on a woman's body and definitely also on her bone. Now, from a recurrence perspective, both tamoxifen and AIs effectively reduce recurrence, or at least for the term uh, that these studies were uh, performed. And the numbers quoted are somewhere around 30 to 50%. But remember, that's relative risk reduction, not absolute risk reduction. And this is always important to understand. So let me give you some examples. So if you were to have, let's say, like a DCIS, so this is a, a common cancer, uh, ductal carcinoma in situ means that it hasn't gone anywhere, right? This is technically a stage zero cancer that has a very low recurrence rate. So it would be quoted in the literature around a two to 3% recurrence rate. So let's just pick one. Let's say the recurrence rate for your particular cancer is 2%. A 50% reduction means 1% absolute reduction. And is 1% worth the potential impact of the drug? 
that's up to you and your doctors. But that's the kind of math that you need to do. Now, obviously, higher stage cancers are going to show greater absolute benefits. So some cancers are going to have high single digits, even double digit recurrence rates. So cutting that in half is not insignificant. Now, when you compare the two types of therapies, AIs typically are going to outperform tamoxifen when it comes to preventing recurrence or reducing recurrence. But we have to look at every uh, intervention, every drug with a risk benefit scenario, is the benefit going to outweigh the risk when you're looking at the risk for the entire body, for the entire woman? What is happening if you use AI, especially AI with ovarian suppression in a premenopausal woman versus tamoxifen? Very different experience for most women. In the postmenopausal woman, same thing. AIs are going to have a usually a different um, side effect profile then would be tamoxifen if tamoxifen were going to be used for postmenopausal women. Now, in general, what we see is that tamoxifen is going to be recommended for premenopausal women and ARs are going to be recommended for postmenopausal women because they are not making estradiol in significant quantities. They're making a little bit of estrone. Hopefully, they're making adequate testosterone. You're just blocking that conversion, which will likely have an impact on uh, symptoms, but will def definitely have an impact on bone. Now, when it comes to the benefits or risks of um, these drugs on bone, we see that tamoxifen can actually protect bone, especially in postmenopausal women, because again, it is estrogenic in certain tissues like bone. For premenopausal women though, premenopausal women may actually experience bone loss. And this is really important to understand because premenopausal women who are cycling naturally are going to have what would be considered a quote unquote estrogen rich environment. Tamoxifen is not going to reduce the estrogen. It is going to change the way the estrogen receptors see the estrogen usually. And so at the bone level, you're actually seeing a reduction in estrogen because it is, it is modulating those receptors. Those receptors aren't seeing all of the estradiol that's present in the system. Now, again, AIs are going to have a significant impact on bone because at the cellular level, you're shutting down estradiol production. It doesn't matter if you're a premenopausal or postmenopausal woman, you are going to see a reduction in estradiol at the cellular level in the bone, and that will re result in a high level of bone turnover. You're going to see CTX go through the roof. Um, your P1 and P is not going to be able to keep up, and you're going to lose bone. Now, when it comes to decision-making, this is a group process. This is going to require usually multiple providers, you need a care team for this. The other thing is that would be helpful is to have as accurate a recurrence rate uh, as possible. And this is going to, again, depend on your cancer stage, the grade, the genetics of the cancer, the hormone receptor status, and probably more. Because again, I'm not an oncologist, but these are the things that I see reported in this decision-making process. But you also have to understand your, your bone density or bone quality and fracture risk at the initiation of treatment. And this is something that is so frequently forgotten and not done. A lot of times when will we put on these drugs and then a year or two years later, because they've been exposed to this risk factor, they'll get a DEXA. My friend who was asking me these questions was smart enough to know that she needed to get a DEXA ahead of time. And guess what? She already has osteoporosis. You think that's going to impact her decision-making? Absolutely it will. So when I had this discussion with my friend, we talked about all the proactive things. You know, all of the things that I talk about, the nutrition, the exercise, um, obviously hormones are off the table for her right now. We talked about all the other potential supplements, you know, does she need to stay away from all estrogen receptor modulators? Could she use, you know, could she use things like phytoestrogen? I mean, just going down all the different pathways, right? Because there are a lot of decisions to be made. Now she can do a lot of these things, but she needs to decide ultimately, is she going to undergo this, the treatment for her would be tamoxifen likely. Is she going to undergo this treatment Knowing that she already has osteoporosis, as a premenopausal woman, she is going to be looking at bone loss. And if that's the case, maybe she should actually consider an anti-resorptive therapy. Now, you don't hear me say this very often, but this is a scenario if you have to be on a drug because you want that reduction in cancer recurrence. If this is your choice, I guess you don't have to, but if this is your choice, knowing then that you will likely have this loss of bone and for this particular case, she's already osteoporotic. Considering an anti-resorptive drug is definitely reasonable because she's going to be on this drug for five years. That's her plan. If your plan is to be on this drug for five years and you could use a drug like Prolium or Reclast 
at the lower doses, you know, the primary prevention doses, relatively low risk, not zero risk, of course, but relatively low risk and prevent that bone loss. This is not an unreasonable time to use an anti-resorptive drug. In fact, it's probably the only time where I consistently say this is an area where I would use these anti-resorptive drugs. Now, I mentioned that she's going to use tamoxifen for five years, likely is, is going to be her choice. There are questions around, should this be extended? I mentioned earlier that these drugs are thought to prevent recurrence for the duration of the time in which they're used and in follow-up, but there is some concern that these drugs actually don't prevent recurrence in the long term, that they just delay. So if you're going to just delay recurrence, then should you push out to 10 years of treatment? or even longer potentially, as some doctors are recommending. There are lots of studies on this, and the extension after five years does seem to, again, reduce recurrence. But the numbers are not as big, and they are not consistent, meaning that in some studies you see a, a reduction, some studies don't meet statistical significance, some studies you don't see any change. So again, I'm not here to tell you how long to take this drug. This is a conversation between you and your team. But when it comes to your bone, know that we really don't have drugs, especially bisphosphonates, that you can be used past the, the, the five-year mark, uh, three, five, maybe seven years. Perlia has safety data out to 10 years. Could you protect your bone out to 10 years with these drugs? Yeah, but a decade is a long time to squash bone turnover. So what is the impact of your bone after five years of adjuvant endocrine therapy and potentially an anti-resorptive drug. So in the end, both tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors are powerful tools, but understanding their nuanced impacts on bone health, symptoms, and menopausal status is crucial. There's really no one-size-fits-all solution. And in fact, something that I should mention here that I, I haven't brought up yet is that I'm talking about bone health, but both of these drugs, these drug classes, uh, the CIRMs and aromatase inhibitors, can significantly uh, affect other symptoms of menopause, meaning that even for premenopausal women, if they're using tamoxifen, you can have symptoms of menopause, even if you're still cycling because it's messing with your estrogen system. Um, some women notice things, you know, like hot flashes, night sweats, but really we hear often more complaints of like brain fog, uh, joint pain, you know, loss of libido, loss of muscle, you know, these things that we hear associated with menopause, sometimes they can be dramatic because it happens instantaneously when you take that drug. Same thing with AI, same thing with AIs, definitely with ovarian suppression in premenopausal women. Everybody's response is going to be different to these drugs. It's not just about your bone. You have to ask the, the, you know, the comprehensive question, what's happening in my body? How do I feel on this drug? Do I want to stay on this drug for three years, five years, 10 years? So anyway, wanted to get that out there. So thanks for hanging in there. I hope this was helpful. This is a very challenging topic. If you know someone who is facing this challenging decision around using these drugs at the, the risk of bone, please share this with them. I love getting this information out in front of people who are having this discussion with their doctors because it is a very confusing space. And remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. Adhere to aging with strength and grace.